This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you to click share. I know we have people still traveling and out of town with their families. And if you're watching online, we'd love to have you join us any Sunday morning at 9 or 11 a.m. or any Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And I've been encouraging you to mark your calendar for January 19 through 22nd, coming up in a few weeks. We're going to have an end times revival with the evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth. And in preparing for the, that week of meetings, I want to encourage you to identify people you know, at least seven, identify seven people you know who don't know the Lord, pray daily for their salvation, and invite and bring them. And don't just wait for these services to do that. We ought to be doing this in our lives every day and every week, looking for opportunities to pray with people, to witness to them, to minister to them, praying for them, praying for their salvation, and inviting and bringing them to church. If you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 21, the Gospel of John chapter 21. And today's message is entitled, Make a Comeback. Tell your neighbor, say, you can make a comeback. Make a comeback. Tell your other neighbor, say, you can make a comeback. Make a comeback. In February, we dealt with the first miraculous catch of fish in Luke chapter five. And if you'll remember in that miracle, Peter said, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. The instructions that Jesus gave made no sense to the natural mind, didn't make common sense. And that's why there are times we've got to walk by faith and not by sight. And Peter said to Jesus, because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now in this series, we've been learning how to write our own ticket with God. And we've been learning how we can take four steps of faith to receive our answer, our miracle, or whatever it is you're believing God for, to say it, to do it, to receive it, and to tell it. And since we began this series, we've received more than 115 written testimonies of miracles, answers to prayer, and testimonies of all kinds. And praise God for it, amen? Uh, he is a miracle working God. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I quoted at the beginning of the service, Acts 10, 38, Jesus went around doing good and healing all. And Hebrews tells us he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now in the Gospels, we have Jesus' first miracle in the Gospel of John. And his first miracle at the wedding in Cana was a miracle of provision. And if you, do, you don't believe that, you've never had a daughter get married. Anybody who's had a child get married recently knows weddings are expensive. And so Jesus was a blessing to a young couple getting married. The first catch of fish in Luke 5 was a miracle of provision. And today's miracle in John 21, the second catch of fish is a miracle of provision. In Luke 5, if you remember, Peter and the other men had worked hard all night and they had caught nothing. Tell your neighbor, nothing. And that, that's always a disappointment. When you put a lot of time and effort into something and there is nothing to show for your effort. Jesus asked to borrow Peter's boat. He was going to speak from it so the crowd could hear him. Peter said yes, and in return, Jesus blessed Peter and the other men. And on that day, Peter met the master of provision. He met God incarnate, Emmanuel, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. 
And Peter learned that Jesus provides and multiplies. And that's why Peter and the others could leave everything behind to follow Jesus. And if you read the Gospels carefully, during that three years, they never had an unmet need. They never went hungry. They never starved. Even when Peter wasn't prepared to pay a certain tax, a temple tax, Jesus made provision. And so Jesus ministered for three years before giving his life for you and for me. He preached the word of God and he taught the people to love God and to love each other. Remember in this series, we've learned that if we would do a better job walking in love, we would walk in a greater degree in the blessing of God. The Bible says it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. And a lot of times we're not missing it on some huge glaring thing. It could be as simple as not walking in love. Jesus demonstrated grace and compassion and mercy. He taught the people in love and in truth. He healed the sick. He set the oppressed free. He even raised the dead. And as you know, religious leaders, government authorities, they put him to death. They, they crucified the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And for the men who had been following Jesus, this was a setback, a disappointment, a failure. Jesus had told them that he would lay down his life, yet they didn't really understand what that meant. And even after he was raised from the dead, they still didn't understand everything he said and what had happened. In John 21, the disciples are discouraged. Now I know we could all act like none of us have ever been discouraged, but there have all been times in life when each of us has been discouraged. And we're to be there for one another, to encourage one another. Not to point out the reason why our husband or wife should be discouraged, but to encourage them in the Lord. They're discouraged. Some had seen the resurrected Christ, yet if you read the Gospels carefully, you see they did not really believe. They did not really have faith that Jesus had truly been raised from the dead. And how do we know that? We know that by what they chose to do in John 21. Jesus had given his life. He had been raised from the dead. He had shown himself, he had shown himself to them and he had proven that he was alive. He told Thomas to touch his hands, to touch his side, where the Romans pierced his side. He told Thomas to touch him. He had even breathed the Holy Spirit upon them. And now they were to go into the whole world they were to preach the gospel, the good news to every creature. And yet we know they didn't really get it. They didn't really believe it. How do we know? By what they chose to do in John 21. John 21, beginning in verse one, afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples so, and praise God for his grace and mercy. Because if we don't get it the first time, he's gonna give us another opportunity. He appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And it happened this way, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And if you remember before Jesus called them into full-time ministry, they were professional fishermen. You know, if I went fishing this week or last week and caught nothing, it probably wouldn't surprise me. I am not a professional fisherman. But these guys were professional fishermen. They knew what they were doing. And yet, because they went back to what their former occupation was, because they went back to what they should not have been doing, they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He appeared to them with his resurrected body, which Paul tells us in Romans and 1 Corinthians, it is, it is more glorious than this body that we have now. This body, it is sown and dishonor. The resurrected body is raised in glory. And it will look similar, but it will be more wonderful in every way that we can imagine. We'll all be better looking, amen. And so he's appearing to them but there's something different in his appearance 
because it is his resurrected body. And as we've learned in this series, the first step is to say it. And Jesus said it. Verse 5, he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? And of course we know he knows. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So Jesus said it. And then even though his instructions made no sense to the natural mind, I mean, this was a, one of those wooden boats, left side, right side, there ain't no fish under the boat. Left side, right side, they had worked all night and had caught nothing. But once God's involved, you're gonna catch something, doesn't matter what the circumstances are. And so even though these instructions made no sense to the natural mind, throw your nets out the right side, verse six says when they did, when they did what Jesus said do, when they obeyed, it says they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. So they did it and they received it. They were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. So they received it and then step four, John told it, verse seven, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John. And I love these things about the gospels. This is why the gospels are trustworthy. They tell us the truth. They even tell us the faults and the shortcomings of the disciples. And, and John has no problem identifying himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. The disciple whom Jesus loved, John said to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, how did they know it was the Lord? Well, John said it, but they also knew it was the Lord because they had been fishing all night, had caught nothing, then Jesus says, cast your net on the right side of the boat, they obey, and now there is a miraculous catch of fish. So as soon as Simon Peter heard John say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other, the, the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish. Tell your neighbor, say, full of fish. Tell your other neighbor, say, full of fish. This is how you know it's God. More than enough, it's the Lord. Not enough, barely enough, that ain't the Lord. Full of fish, more than enough. For they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish. So, so not little fish. You know, a few months ago, Derek, my brother-in-law was so kind, he took Samuel fishing off a dock in Missouri. And they, they caught some little perch, you know, maybe about this big. But those aren't the kind of fish you take home for Thanksgiving dinner. So notice their net was full of fish, but what kind of fish? Large fish, big ones. You can eat. You can sell, they're worth something. Large fish, how many? 153 large fish. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So now there was no doubt. There had been a miracle of provision. They knew it was the Lord. Now, something I want you to think about, and you can read about this in your own time this week, go to Mark's gospel, Mark 8. It's also in Matthew's gospel. But in the gospels earlier, after Jesus had fed a large crowd, not just once, but twice, the disciples were still worried about bread. Even after Jesus had multiplied five loaves and two fish for 5,000 men, plus women and children, the disciples still doubted the provision of God. They were worried about bread and having enough to eat. They were still doubting the provision of God. He fed large crowds on more than one occasion. And when he did those miracles, there was plenty left over. The gospels say when he fed the crowd of 5,000 men plus women and children, there were 12 basketfuls of food left over. Yet you read a little bit on, they're with Jesus and they're worried about having bread because they had gotten in the boat, they had set off across the lake, and they didn't have lunch. And they were worried about not 
eating. And that's the level too many of us live at, and God wants us to come to a higher level, to where we're no longer doubting the provision of God. My parents tell me that when I was a child, I was always worried about the next meal. And I would always ask what we were eating at the next meal. When are we having lunch? What are we having for lunch? What are we having for dinner? When are we having dinner? At dinner, what are we eating tomorrow? And of course, I don't look like I've ever gone without a meal. Although once my father sent me to bed without a meal, it made an impact on my life. My mom had made something, I guess it wasn't what I wanted, and I, I made an unkind comment. He happened to hear, and I went to bed without dinner that night. It made an impact on my, I'm telling you about it right now. <laughs> but now that we have little kids, Michaela, she, she loves to eat. And we could be eating dinner, she wants to know what we're having for lunch tomorrow. Well, Paul said that th when we were children, we thought like children, but there comes a time where to grow up and where to put childish ways behind us. And so the disciples, even though Jesus had done these amazing miracles, more than enough to eat, they were still worried about eating. On this day, how did they know it was the Lord? Because John told it, and then they saw this miracle of provision. It's the Lord. It's the Lord. They knew it was the Lord. And friends, we have not yet come to the place where we are no longer worried about provision. But it is possible to come to the place where you know God is your source, God is your supply, and you are no longer worried about provision. You just know that you know that you know because you walk in covenant with your heavenly Father, you live the life of being a giver, of being generous, that your every need is met, your every bill will be paid, and there will always be plenty left over. You may not know exactly how it's going to happen. You may not know exactly how it will come in, but you know it will come in because you know God is your source and God is your supply. Verse 13, Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them with the fish. This was now the third time he had appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. What is the challenge of faith? The challenge of faith is to believe God and to follow Jesus and to stay in faith even when we, set, when we face disappointments, setbacks, and failures. The disappointment or failure could be a financial setback. It could be losing a job or home, a bankruptcy. It could be a situation that didn't go your way. It could be a sickness or an illness. Someone, maybe even a husband or wife, letting you down. For Peter and the other men, their disappointment had been the death of Jesus. And yes, he had been risen, but they didn't really believe it. And we know by what they chose to do. They went back to their boats and nets. They went back to their former way of life. And for three years, these grown married men had traveled with Jesus in ministry. And Jesus had provided for them every step of the way. And I know sometimes people say, well, he, he sent them out in ministry without provisions. Yes, the first time. That's why, as Paul Harvey said, we read the rest of the story. When he sent them out the second time, he told them to take provisions with them. A money bag, even a sword. Why would you take a sword? As we all know in Texas, for self-defense. And when you read about Jesus sending them out a second time, the Bible says, they, he asked them, did you lack anything? And they said, no. He sent them out the first time without provision to teach them to trust their heavenly Father for provision. You might say, well, has he heard this religious objection and that religious objection? I've heard them all. Did you lack anything? No, they answered. Jesus had provided every step of the way, yet now they're having a hard time believing for provision. They're out fishing again, and once again, the master of provision shows up. Peter loved Jesus. And I remember many years ago, this would have been seven or eight years ago, I think around this time of the year, and I, and I preached on how Peter can be an encouragement to all of us. Because I think we all feel that at one point, at one time, in all of our lives, we've all let God down some way, somehow. 
And Peter loved the Lord. He left everything to follow Jesus. He was loyal, bold. He was bold and devoted. So much so, when the religious leaders arrested Jesus in anger, Peter cut off one of their ears. Like us, Peter was imperfect. When Jesus asked questions, he didn't always have the right answer. When Jesus taught, Peter didn't always understand, although the one time when Jesus asked, who do you say I am? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And as we all know, Peter denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. No doubt he struggled with believing God and living by faith. And after denying Jesus three times, not once, not twice, but three times, Peter must have felt like, he must have thought that he was no longer fit to serve God. So what did he do? He returned to his boats and nets. And once again, Jesus, the master of provision, showed up. The challenge of faith for any of us in our lives, the challenge of faith is this, to believe God, to follow Jesus, to stay in faith, even when we face disappointments, setbacks, and failures. Maybe you didn't accomplish a goal. Maybe you failed at a career or job path or even a business idea. Maybe you had to drop out of school. Friend, you can always go back to school. Maybe you lost a job. Well, praise God, there are a lot of jobs. You can get another one. Maybe a marriage failed. Maybe a child disappointed you. Maybe you disappointed your family. Maybe you faced a sickness and struggled with believing God for healing. Maybe in your heart you know there's an area of life or more than one area of life where you haven't really obeyed God the way you should. No matter the disappointment, the setback, the failure, I want to encourage you today, shake it off. Tell, tell your neighbor, say, shake it off. Shake it tell your other neighbor, say, shake it off. Shake it off. Stop looking at the problem or the failure or the disappointment, whatever it is, and look to Jesus. Look to the one who is the answer and the solution. He said, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the answer. Doesn't matter what the situation is. Doesn't matter what the problem is. Jesus is the answer. Look to him. Verse three, Simon Peter said, I'm going out to fish. They said, we'll go with you. So maybe you faced a disappointment and maybe your attitude was fine, I'm quitting, I'm throwing in the towel. Friend, we've all felt that way at one point or another. Now, whether or not we'll all admit it is another thing, but we've all felt that way at some time in our lives. Or maybe you thought, fine, I'm gonna quit and go back to what I did before. I know I've had that attitude before. There, I know, we, we don't talk about negative things. Why? You didn't come here this morning to hear the negative. You came to hear the positive. But, but there'll be times I'll be discouraged and Jessica will tell me, shake it off. Shake it off. And that, that's what we ought to be doing in each other's lives, cheering each other on. You can do it. Shake it off. Okay, that didn't go the way you thought it would. Shake it off. Go again. That is the challenge of faith, to obey God, to follow Jesus, to remain in faith despite disappointments, setbacks, and failures. They went back to their former way of life. They went fishing and they caught nothing. Verse three, they went out, got into the boat, but that night they, they, that night they caught nothing. When someone gets disappointed and they choose to go back to their former way of life or they choose to go back into sin or they choose to stop living for God, they're signing up for disappointment and failure. We can go back, but we'll catch nothing. We can go back, but we'll catch nothing. We can do our own thing, but the results will be nothing. Once we give our lives to God, there is no turning back. Jesus said it this way, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. That was the problem with Lot's wife. God in his grace and mercy, not because of how Lot had lived, God in his grace and mercy because of Abraham sent angels to bring Lot and his family out of Sodom. But Lot's wife, she had a problem. She was leaving, but looking back. Jesus is the answer. 
You gotta stop looking to old friends, old relationships, old jobs. Maybe a New Year's resolution should be to get on Facebook and unfriend everybody you should no longer be friends with. Doesn't mean you don't love them, this just doesn't mean you don't need to be, know what's going on in their lives. And thinking about what if I married her, what if I married him, what if I did that, what if I did this? Amen. You gotta look to Jesus. Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus who is the author, the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. You can go back, but you'll catch nothing. They caught nothing, why? They weren't supposed to be out fishing for fish. They were supposed to be fishing for men and women. Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you fishers of people. And as long as they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, they always had more than enough. But as soon as they went back to doing what they formerly did, what Jesus called them from, then the results were nothing. As long as you're doing things your way, not God's, you'll not be as happy or as successful or as fulfilled as you could be. When you do things your way, not God's, there will always be a lid, a limit on your life. Do you want to take the lid off in 2020? I said, do you want to take the lid off your life in 2020? Do you want to take the limits off your life in 2020? You got to start doing things God's way. He called them to be fishers of men, yet they had gone back to doing their own thing. He had gone back, he had called them to be fishers of men. They had seen the risen, resurrected Christ, yet they went back to doing their own thing. And in our lives, when we do what Jesus has not called us to do, we will be unsuccessful. When we do what he has not called us to do, we will be unsuccessful. But praise God, God is good. God is loving, God is gracious, God is merciful, God is forgiving, and he is the God of second chances, and third chances, and fourth chances, and fifth chances, and you might say, Austin, I'm on my 35th chance. As long as there is breath in your body, as long as you have another day, the good news is you get another chance to live for God and to live the way you should you get another chance. His mercies are new every morning. We just gotta begin doing things his way, not ours. So Jesus showed up. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answer. I can see them being embarrassed and ashamed. That's like God asking us, how's it working out for you doing your own thing? How's it working out not living by faith? How's it working out not obeying my word? Well, we know the answer. Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answer. In your life, when you faced a setback, when you've gotten out of faith, when you've gone back to doing your own thing, there is a solution. Once again, hear and obey God. Once again, follow Jesus. Once again, do what he says do. Once again, follow the master of provision. Throw your net out on the right side of the boat and you will find some. What an understatement. They caught 153 large fish. Well, guys, throw your nets out on the right side and the result will be better than the result you had. What an understatement. 153 large fish, when they did so, when they did what Jesus said do, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. It's so simple. How did they receive their miracle? How did they receive their answer? By hearing and obeying, by just doing whatever Jesus said do. That's what happened when Jesus did his first miracle. His mother Mary said to the servants, just do whatever he tells you. It's so simple, hear and obey, hear and take action, hear and do. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. How can you receive your miracle? Hear and obey. Tell your neighbor, say, hear and obey. How can you receive from God? Tell your other neighbor, say, hear and obey. How, how do we walk by faith day after day, despite people trying to hurt us or harm us or oppose us? How, how do we walk by faith day after day when there's this negative thing or that negative thing by continually hearing and obeying God? 
How do you see your dreams become a reality over time? By hearing and obeying God. They were unable, verse six says, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Verse 11, Simon Peter climbed aboard, dragged the net ashore. He was so excited. He dragged that net to shore by himself. That's how excited he was. That's the miracle Jesus did. And we know no matter how much Peter worked out, he could not have done that in his own strength. He was excited about that miracle. And he was excited that he knew, that he knew, that he knew that Jesus was alive and he had been raised from the dead. He was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. So once again, they went from nothing to something. They went from nothing to abundance. They went from not enough to more than enough. And that's what happens when we partner our life together with God. That's what happens when we obey God and his word. That's what happens when we live by faith and not by doubt. That's what happens when we just do what Jesus says do. That's what happens when we hear and obey. The challenge of faith day after day after day is to believe God, to follow Jesus, and to remain in faith despite any disappointments, any setbacks, and any failures. In your life, maybe you faced a disappointment or a setback or a failure. We all have. You know, and if I wanted to make a list of negative things, I could. We focus on the positive. We focus on the victories. And if there is a negative thing, in the midst of that, we don't, we're not silly enough to give God the credit for that. We know it's the enemy. And we're commissioned to destroy the works of the devil. So in the midst of any negative thing, by faith, we thank God for the victory. And we stand in faith until we get the victory over whatever it is. You know, Jessica and I, in preparing our letter of testimonies and faith goals for next year, for today, for pastors, you know, one of the things on our, our list last year, on that list of faith goals, we were believing for Michaela that two warts would disappear from her hands. One was on her left hand, on her finger, by the nail bed, a very painful place. It really hurt her. The other was on her right hand. It was a bigger one. That was on our list last year, this same time of year, first Sunday, December last year. In 2019, we're believing that these warts will disappear. And of course, we're, we're loving parents. And so we did what we could do in the natural to help her, to get it taken care of. That didn't work. There are times when natural treatments and remedies don't work. Praise God for them, but there are times when those things don't work. And so you've heard me rehearse how we taught her anytime she thought about it, anytime there was pain, just to thank the Lord for healing her and to say that she was healed and to say they were going away. Well, today in today's letter for our testimonies for 2019, I was able to put on these two different dates, the first few months ago, the, the wart on her left hand on the finger disappeared. And just in the last few weeks, the other one completely disappeared from her hand. So we, we don't get into doubt and negativity and unbelief. We're not foolish enough to say that's God or God's teaching me something or God's doing something. No, we say that's the devil. And we do what the word of God says. We destroy the works of the devil and we stand in faith and we say what God says and we say what his word says until we have the victory or until we have the manifestation of whatever it is we're believing God for. Go back to Mark 11. Jesus said, have faith in God. And then he said, a few verses down, that we will have whatsoever we saith. And he said there in Mark 11, that after we've prayed, we are to believe that we receive. And so you might say, well, Austin, I haven't received yet. What do I do on Monday? You wake up and you believe that you receive. What do I do on Tuesday? You wake up 
and you believe that you receive. And on Wednesday, you believe that you receive. And the next week, you believe that you receive. And you just keep believing that you receive. And sooner or later, the answer will come. Sooner or later, the power of God will manifest. And you will have your answer, your miracle, your victory. If you will stand in faith, no matter what, the circumstances are. If you will not get negative, no matter what the circumstances are. Maybe you faced a disappointment or setback or failure. We all have. Shake it off. Pick yourself up. Dust yourself off. Let God turn those ashes into something beautiful. Give God your disappointment. Give God your failure. Give God what hasn't worked. Take what is not enough and put it into the hands of Jesus and let him multiply it into more than enough. Rise up. Be who God has called you to be and say what God's word says about your life. That's why if you're new, we make the confession that we make before every message on Sunday mornings. This is the Bible. This is whose Bible? My Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, get one. And I'm all for the technology. I'm as nerdy as the next person. Probably nerdier than anyone here. I'm nerdy. I'll admit it. I'm not ashamed of it. And the technology is wonderful right up until it doesn't work. There's nothing like having your own Bible. It's your name on it. It's yours to read, to study, to have. You have. Someday you can pass it down to a child or grandchild. And I'm not, I'm not a conspiracy person either, but it's possible we could wake up one day and all the, the technology and the Bibles online have completely disappeared. And then I'll look like a genius and pastor will look like a genius because we're, ho we're hoarding NIV and New King James Bibles. How many do you have? Enough to rest the le rest of my lifetime if the Lord tarries. So we're not just, we don't just make that confession before the message is on Sunday just to do something. We're doing something of eternal significance. This is the Bible, but you ought to say, this is my Bible. It is God's word and God's will for your life. And you are who God says you are. You may not feel like it, especially after overeating this week and all that pie. You may not feel like it, but you are who God says you are. If you have confessed and repented of your sins, if you have prayed the prayer, if you have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, you're saved, you're a part of God's family, you're a son or daughter of God, you may not feel like it, but you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You're where the word says you are, not in the place of defeat. The Bible says, Paul says, you're seated right now in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. And what do you have? You have everything, every promise, every blessing, every benefit, every reward. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.20 that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. How many of his promises? All. They are yes and amen. And there is disagreement as to how many promises there are in the Word of God, but there's at least more than 6,000. And Paul says they're all yes and amen in Christ. Man, that ought to encourage you. That ought to make you happy, make you joyful. So you have what the Word says you have. All the blessings, all the benefits are yours. And you can do how many things? All things. Through who? Through ourselves, through our bright ideas, through our unparalleled wisdom. No, we can do all things through who? Christ. Through Christ who gives us. So even if we don't think we have it, we do because he gave it to us. You may not feel like, but your mind is alert. Your spirit is receptive. Your life is being changed for the better and you'll never be the same again. Why don't we say, say 2020 yes. will not just be, not just be. another year. It will be a year of progress, a year of breakthrough, a year of changing levels, a year of answered prayer, a year of miracles. You can do all things through Christ. You can do all things through him. He's given you the strength and the greater one. 
lives in you. So you can make a comeback. Doesn't matter if you failed. Doesn't matter if you feel like you've disappointed God or loved ones or others. God loves you. God forgives you. So rise up and be who God has called you to be. Do what he has called you to do. Make a comeback. Tell your neighbors, say, make a comeback. Make a comeback. Tell your other neighbors, say, make a comeback. Make a comeback. Tell them, say, you can do it. You can do it. Tell your other neighbors, say, with God, with God. All, things all things are possible. Friends, it's time to make a comeback. You can do it. You can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. And don't let anyone tell you that you can.